So I'm, I'm Emmett Cunningham. I'm an ophthalmologist now, mostly venture capitalist. I have no gene therapy investments personally. Our firm has one, AvroBio, which is non-ophthalmic. Um, but I follow the space very closely. I don't know as much about it as the people on the panel, so we'll all learn from them. I'm going to ask, since this is videoed and uh, people will not have remembered your talk from this morning or have seen it if they only watch the video, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself in a, in a sentence and, and why you're interested or how you've been interested in gene therapy. We'll start closest. Is this on? Can you hear? You guys hear? Okay, great. Okay, I'm Dave Kern. I'm CEO and co-founder of 4D Molecular Therapeutics, and we're a next-generation AV uh, vector platform company developing uh, highly targeted vectors for intravitreal delivery to the retina and other tissues in the body. Great. And I'm Carl Schocke. I'm a retina specialist at the Retina Foundation of the Southwest. Uh, I've been involved in the gene therapy space for a long time. I actually worked initially with Mike Blaze and French Anderson, who were some of the real pioneers in gene therapy was on the regulatory advisory committee for the FDA and was also on the executive committee overseeing some of the um, uh, NEI LCA trials and now I'm um, involved as a clinician in um, many of the gene therapy trials that we do at the Retina Foundation. My name is Tom Chula. Um, I'm a retina specialist. I've been involved in um, anti-VEGF uh, innovation both in the lab and in the clinic and now I work at Spark Therapeutics as the uh, medical strategy lead in ophthalmology. My name is Barry Katz. I'm a neuro-ophthalmologist, uh, basically a clinician who moved into industry over the years, and I'm currently chief medical officer for GenPsych Biologics in Paris, France. Great. So we have four panelists who have lots of personal, professional experience with gene therapy. Uh, I've written down the questions because sometimes uh, people like to read them and see them. We'll go to our first question. And um, talk about what I think personally is a pretty significant advance um, landmark in medicine, and that's the uh, Spark Luxterna FDA approval. Um, Barrett, as an outsider looking, we'll save Tom for last because he, he has to be a little bit modest. Um, Barrett, what, what does that mean? What do you think it's meant for medicine ophthalmology? I hate to be histrionic. This is a profound, profound change in gene therapy, not just for ophthalmology, but for medicine. I think that the approval, the approval of this drug is just gets the people on the playing field. I think now what we're going to see is the approval of this drug will change how we practice medicine. I think it will change how we develop gene therapies. I think it has enormous import for this whole arena. Um, I think what we've seen is that here's a company that designed a totally different set of endpoints that were put together around functional vision. They put together a multi-luminance mobility test. They put together a light sensitivity test. They coupled these with extraordinary testing of visual field and a Goldman perimetry. They did this in a pediatric population. And they demonstrated efficacy and convinced the agencies for approval. But to me, this is just the beginning. I think what we're going to see is we've got to follow this company to see several things. How do they develop a business model that is successful over years for a one-time therapy? How do they deal with reimbursement issues for, in a sense, a very expensive drug? How do they make the arguments to convince payers? I also think that this approval will change the nature of genetic testing for clinicians because all of a sudden we have diseases which heretofore were not treatable that will become treatable. And so I think this will afford us an enormous opportunity to better define genotypic changes and their phenotypic expressions. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a game changer. Um, <clears throat> so Carl, any comments to add to that? No, I would agree. You know, I mean, this whole thing started almost in the early 90s. So it's been 25 years, if you look at the development of, of gene therapy for an ophthalmic indication. And as Barrett said, it's, it's monumental in terms of the steps that the company took to convince the, the agency for approval. And as he said, going forward. At the same time, I think it's also worthy of a note of caution um, because you know while it, it was approved, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an easy road going forward. And I do think that as we talk about, you know, the, the targets of, of gene therapy, you know, they, they're all very challenging. And, um, but, the, but the fact that we have one now that's, that's, that's gone the uh, distance and is now in the clinic is, is monumental. David, uh, Sparks a competitor, sort of, not directly, but a uh, different company. Any, you want to add anything from a uh, I want to outdo you perspective? Not at all. I think uh, they've done a fantastic job getting this approved. I think it's great for the whole field. Certainly the tip of the iceberg. I think there'll be many uh, approvals in ophthalmology and other therapeutic areas to follow. I think Sparks also led the way on pricing. I think that's going to be an important component of these therapies, and I think they've done a, a really nice job there. So I just, you know, I think... It's a, it's a fantastic start. It's a great proof of concept, but I, I believe it's the tip of the iceberg and there'll be more to follow. Yeah, I'm, just to add my own personal commentary, um, I, wish, I wish ophthalmology were a bigger part of Spark. You know, even as, as costly as this one-time therapy is on a one-time treatment, it's probably not going to generate the majority of their revenues in their business plan, and so on. We'll see how much ophthalmology they do. I hope they do more. Um, do you want to comment, Tom, or do you want to just drop the mic and say thank you very much? <laughs> Well, I, I, I think the, the comments were um, all accurate, and I agree with them all. I'm looking at it from an um, uh, in, you know, industry level. Um, but I like to look at it um, the way my friend Praveen Dugal likes to look at it as well. What does this mean for the two guys who are practicing clinical retina in Idaho? And um, uh, to some of Barrett's points, um, I think it changes paradigms how we practice medicine, how we practice retina. So I think, number one, it changes how we think about endpoints. Because as retina specialists, we're all conditioned to think about maculopathies. What we heard all day today was about diabetic macular edema and AMD, and of course, with that goes visual acuity. And um, that's a test of um, visual function. And what's happened is we've now changed how endpoints are viewed. And, and I, think, I think the practicing retina specialist just needs to understand that this is a new paradigm. So functional vision, as Barrett was saying. So it's not just about visual acuity anymore. It's, we need to think about other forms of vision. I've had um, clinicians come up to me and say that the therapy uh, didn't work because we didn't hit our visual acuity endpoint. And they totally misunderstand that this is a rod disease. It's not expected to, 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 to benefit the cones much and not, not, not expected to um, change the visual acuity much. So the FDA uh, just last week put out a really nice set of um, guidance documents, including one on retinal gene therapy. I recommend reading it. Um, and they talk about this, uh, but we're moving into an era of alternative endpoints, functional uh, uh, endpoints. And so the MLMT, for example, um, you know, is functional vision, and it correlates to visual function, including visual fields, light sensitivity, um, and visual acuity. But uh, I think we heard a little bit of a discussion on um, endpoints earlier. Um, we heard that um, uh, geographic atrophy from fundus autofluorescence uh, is now an accepted um, endpoint for, for, for geoatrophy trials, and, and it'll be more to come. So I think clinicians need to understand that we're in a new era where there'll be different endpoints. I think number two is the practicing retinal clinicians in Idaho need to understand that we're entering into an era of orphan disease treatments. And the, the treatment paradigm is totally different. I've had so many retina specialists come up to me who want to be treatment centers. And I think there might be more retina specialists in the country than people with this disease. So it's just simply not possible. And so I think, I think that we have to understand that this is more like treating ocular melanoma we're doing um, uh, surgery for retinal detachment from ROP. It's a whole new sort of quaternary referral model in, in, these, in these orphan disease paradigms where you'll have centers of excellence. And that's just how it is in, in orphan disease. And then I think number three, one of the panelists said this, is we're entering into an era of precision medicine. And, and clinicians must start testing their patients. It's vitally important because you, we need to give our patients an accurate diagnosis um, and everybody wins by giving the patient an accurate diagnosis. We're providing better medicine. The clinician themselves is, is building up a um, database of, of patients um, who are genotyped in their practice. And they're going to be approached by companies who want to do gene therapy trials. Um, and uh, you know, ultimately, um, everybody wins by doing that. So I think that's how it changes uh, paradigms for the two guys practicing in, in Idaho, as Praveen likes to say. Yep, great.
Okay, are there important near-term milestones for ophthalmic gene therapy, either clinical or preclinical? That is to say, when I drafted this question, what, what's gonna happen over the next six or 12 months that are, is either gonna put wind ahead of us or behind us in the gene therapy space in ophthalmology? What, what do you, Carl, what are you most interested to see as far as readouts? Yeah, so, you know, the preclinical modeling can be sometimes fairly straightforward. You know, you can take a mouse model and do a knockout and then put the gene back. And so in many cases, the animal datas are an essential feature, but at the same time, they, you know, don't really um, help us in terms of the clinical outcomes. And so what I'm really excited about is what Tom was talking about, this idea that as we think about these diseases, can we start to investigate and interrogate the retina functionally in other ways to see if the trials that we're, uh, are ongoing, even in their phase one, is the nice thing about these, these, these treatments is they are very s specific. And so we should see if they're working fairly quickly, uh, some readout that tells us that there's having some effect on the retinal function. And I think from my perspective, what I see the most excitement is that, you know, that, that aspect of in the clinic, in the early trials, are we starting to see some readout uh, that, that tells us there's proof of concept and that the gene product is being um, produced and is some way therapeutic? So, David, I have a sort of related question. First, tell me what you're excited to see, and then I'll ask my follow-up question, which is related to optimization of vectors. Well, I'm completely biased, but what I'm excited to see is uh, the lead 4D uh, product get into the clinic. We're looking to file an IND at the end of this year and initiate clinical testing uh, early next year, and this will be the first use of a, a targeted, optimized intravitreal vector uh, where we hope to target the entire retina and treat patients with choroideremia and eventually other genetic diseases at a much earlier stage and try to cover the whole retina and just not the, the region that can be addressed with a subretinal injection. So we, we hope to be the, the beginning of a new wave of, of treating the entire retina uh, and, and moving away from the subretinal. Uh, injection procedure. So let me ask you, since some of people may not have either had an opportunity to ask or didn't see your earlier presentation where you, you presented very nice data on optimization of an AAV vector that could have much more widespread and we presume durable expression in the retina, both across the retina and through the retinal layers. Uh, is there such a thing as too much expression for these vectors? Do we worry that it'll be toxic or cause too much inflammation? Sure. I think with, with any novel improved vector, there's, there's certainly a, a, a chance of, of going too far. Certainly in gene therapy to date, that's never been an issue. It's really been all about trying to maximize transduction and, and gene expression. But certainly with optimized vectors, it may be that you need to dial back that dose as, as you do with any potent biologic. Um, so that's something we'll be looking at. Certainly for choroideremia, there's no evidence that overexpression of REP1 can be toxic at this point, and certainly night stars have nice safety with subretinal injection in these patients. But I'm sure down the road there may be disease indications where we really need to think about dialing back the dose or having regulatable promoters to, to really titrate the gene expression. So from a clinical perspective, some of the milestones that we'll, we may have readouts on over the year plus are AGTCs, achromatopsia, exenchronoschisis, Regenex Bio has a FAB, an anti-VEGF FAB that would be intended to go after the, the VEGF-related conditions. Gensite's going to have another phase three that, to readout. Um, and maybe there are others that people want to mention, but I'd like to hear your cautionary word, if there is one, in that what, how do you interpret a negative trial in, in the context that that vector may not have been a great vector? Should we give up on the indication, or do we have to just do it vector by vector and keep trying? Well, the, the history of gene therapy suggests that you know, many of these wild-type naturally occurring vectors that are not targeted uh, will be inefficient and, and, and not really show you the maximum potential benefit for patients. So I think we have to be very careful to say, you know, if, if a particular product fails in a patient population, uh, was it really something about that indication of the transgene, or was it really more about inefficient vector uh, delivery? And I think that's really been an issue to date, and, and we certainly hope with targeted vectors we can overcome that limitation. Carl? Right. And, and that's the reason why I think that these novel clinical readouts are so critical, because one of the challenges we have in the diseases we treat with gene therapy, unlike the anti-VEGFs, where we have the OCT readout. And so early on, we could determine 
that certain anti-VEGF agents were better than others based on the OCT. So there was a, an, a very quick readout. And, um, and so when we talk about vector biology, which is the right vector, uh, how much transgene to put in, we still don't have yet, and I think this is what is so critical and needed, is a, quick, a, a relatively quick readout so we can make these comparisons and say that a certain AAV subtype may be giving us better readouts and the, tr and the amount of, of vector that we're putting in, something in the clinical realm that gives us some confidence that as we make these modifications, it's actually having an impact on the, on the potential outcomes. Because that's one of the challenges in many of our discussions. Sometimes we don't even know, did they actually the gene get in? And if it is getting in, is it being expressed? There's no way for us to really monitor that. So having those clinical tools, I think, is going to be extremely critical. Just to translate that into uh, uh, other therapeutic areas. So in hemophilia, obviously, we have that, right? You can measure a factor level, uh, and that's a very objective and quick uh, measure of, 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 of uh, expressivity. But we don't have that in the retina, to your point. So Barrett, Tom, did I miss? Did we miss any milestones that you're looking I think for? One I wanted to highlight that you mentioned, I think the Regenix um, BioFab um, is especially important because that's what actually a whole nother paradigm because all the ones that we've discussed so far are basically you know, monogenic disease, uh, there's a gene defect, there's autosomal recessive disease, the, the protein's not being expressed and we're replacing it. But I think the Regenix bio um, uh, is a new uh, paradigm because we're going to be producing a therapeutic protein as opposed to replacing a missing protein. And as you know, that this area has been littered with failures in the past, and it may be for the reasons that you were dis discussing. Um, and if it works, it's going to be massively disruptive. Massively yeah, I disruptive. I agree. I agree. Uh, Barrett? No further comments. I, I would add one thing about the vector. Um, the point was made earlier today that um, one could, in a generic sense, think of the, the vector as drug delivery. And one of the issues to think about is um, what is the efficiency of the vector chosen? What is the inflammatory response that the vector is instituting? Does that work for or against your intervention? And I think we're so early in this field that we, we just don't have enough experience to answer. So since you mentioned that, and then I'll move on, I have a question for David, another tech, sort of technical question, but when you express so much, do you induce more anti-vector antibodies and neutralize it quicker? Is there any evidence for that? We have evidence to uh, suggest the opposite. So um, what we find is that with more targeted vectors, as with any targeted biologic, you get less, less off-target effect, more specific delivery, uh, certainly in the, the, uh, in the retina and also with IV administration. So what we find is less of an immune response, less, we're, we're less likely to see uh, uh, immune response induction, say, to a transgene like GFP, which is foreign. So generally speaking, I think with, with biologics, the more targeted they are, the less immunogenic they are, and, and the safer they're going to be. And that's certainly something we're seeing in non-human primates with these targeted vectors. Carl, you want to comment? Yeah, so I think this is a, a still big question mark and, and something that I think is, is undergoing you know, study. And that is this idea of, of where is the uh, sweet spot in terms of uh, the amount of vector and what you really want to get. Um, and so I think, like anything, uh, there will be a sweet spot. And, you know, we have to think of all of these, most of these vectors at some point, um, you know, they do contain proteins that um, are not normally expressed. And so when you're talking about giving too much, um, you know, we need to understand, is there a point of too much? Um, but what we really want to get is the right amount to give us the right amount of, of transgene expression that is reparative and gives us a clinical outcome. And that's something that I think will take some, some time and effort and, of course, the dosing and things like that that these trials typically undergo. Well, it's definitely the case that we know much less about optimizing um, these vectors than we do about small molecule or biologic development. So it's a much more empiric and one-off. Are there ophthalmic applications uh, for gene therapy that are more attractive than, other, than others? Uh, in the cornea, for example, neuroprotection, Barrett, you mentioned that earlier. What excites you? If you could, Tom, if you could go into your CEO's office and pound the table, as I know you like to do, and could say, we must, we must study this indication, what would it be after the ones you're studying? <laughs> Well, as I mentioned, I, I think the Regenix bio readout um, 
uh, is an important readout because uh, the area has been littered with a few failures. Um, it, it's the first time in ophthalmology that we've used gene therapy to produce a therapeutic protein. Um, it's massively productive. There's a massive unmet need. We know anti-VEGFs work, but, but patients are undertreated by far. If you look at real-world studies, um, uh, at the end of one year, patients um, only get one letter improvement. If you, if you average uh, the major trials together, they get eight and a half letters improvement. But if, if you look at real world studies, they get one letter. So could, we have. Could we put any fab into an AAV and have it produced, or is it something special about their vector and their fab? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, as you know, uh, uh, what actually is expressed is a result of, of hundreds of different variables. It can be um, the vector, it can be how it's delivered, it could be the promoter, the enhancer, codon op optimization. So it's a, it's a, it's a mix of, of multiple um, factors. And I think, you know, David is, David's company is, is obviously trying to optimize that further. Um, and, you know, there are issues like intravitreal versus subretinal. There, there's just a whole host of, of variables. But, um, but I think that's, that's obviously observing unmet need. It's a massive market. Um, and I, I think it'll be um, something that would, would help patients uh, just incredibly. David, do you want to add to that? I'd say in terms of applications, we think of monogenic recessive diseases as being the, essentially the low-hanging fruit. I think uh, Spark did a great job picking LCA2 because it's a disease where the target cells are intact, otherwise healthy, and you just need to reintroduce that pathway. So that's really an ideal situation and one where you can actually see improvement. So I think that's an ideal sort of de-risk clinical indication where you can see improvement and it's a, it's a known monogenic recessive disorder. I think the other interesting applications will be ones with therapeutic uh, validation of the actual molecule. So as we've been saying for wet AMD with the anti-VEGF inhibitors, uh, that's a very de-risk area. So if you get gene expression, it really should work. So that's a very interesting one where you can also see near-term improvement and get a rapid clinical readout. So at least for us, when we think about trying to de-risk our programs, those are the types of diseases that we're particularly interested in going after. I think when you get into something like neuroprotection with a novel transgene, novel endpoints, novel disease, that may have great potential, but it's, it's much riskier, and that's something we probably do later after we've validated the vector. Okay. Any comments on front of the eye disease? I know that, David, you had a Fuchs dystrophy program, is that correct? You? No, we, we oh, don't. I'm sorry, no. I apologize. Somebody. ProQR. Uh, ProQR, pro pro I'm sorry. Yeah, ProQR. All right. Uh, <clears throat> explain the importance of vector type and construction. We talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, the, how different constructs can lead to different transfection rates, expression, durability, inflammation, et cetera. Since we've covered much of this, I just want to point it to one part, which is inflammation. My understanding of the trials from the methods that have been produced is that you have to pre-treat these patients fairly heavily to control the inflammation. On the one hand, on the other hand, patients are not losing vision from the inflammation, so it is controllable. Uh, Tom, to the extent you can, what, how do you think about inflammation in, in these therapies? Is, it, is this a, a reality, and does it limit it to only really blinding disorders, or is it not, not serious at all and easy to control? How do you think about it as a risk? Well, you're the, you're the expert on UVI's inflammation, but, um, you know, the eye is an immune privileged site. The subretinal space is, is specifically immune privileged. Um, in the uh, Luxterna phase three trials, there were no deleterious immune responses. Um, so, you know, it was very well tolerated in terms of inflammation. Once you start injecting into the, the vitreous, um, you know, there's a higher risk of inflammation. Uh, you know, that's, that's very... Uh, a broad generality, but it's but but it, it's typically um, true. Now, as as you optimize capsids, I suppose you may find one that's less inflammatory. And David can probably comment on that um, um, further. Do you worry about inflammation, David? Yeah, I think with any biologic uh, infusion, certainly inflammation is always something you want to keep an eye on. We use standard, moderate, uh, transient immunosuppression, as is routinely done with AAV gene therapies, and we find excellent tolerability in non-human primates, but it's certainly something to keep an eye on and to you know, optimize over time. And it may very well be dose dependent. So depending on the dose and where you, how, how close the vector has to be to the cells that you want to transduce, may be a critical parameter. When you inject subretinally, you don't need to have as high a dose. When you start going in the vitreous and you can now have the 
ability to go up on the dose, uh, there may be doses at which uh, we do see significant inflammation. So again, it will depend on where you treat and the, um, and the amount of vector that you're putting into that space that may ultimately limit our abilities to, um, to, to, to give as much vector as, as we want. Okay, uh, so we, we've touched on the subretinal delivery route. Um, I've met with companies that say, no big deal, easy as pie, anybody can do it, the cornea surgeons can do it. And I've met with others who've said, well, it's, you know, there's some significant morbidity associated with this. How big of a deal is the, the requirement of a subretinal delivery? And how, uh, conversely, how big of an advance would it be if we could actually get to an intravitreal route that was safe and effective? So Carl, as the independent on the panel, what would right. you say? I mean, you know, I think the technology around subretinal delivery has improved dramatically. There are now better tools um, to, to do it. And I also think um, where intraoperative OCT is also going to be an important uh, additive because it's going to allow us to monitor one of the, the things that's still a variable is when you're doing subretinal uh, injections is the, you know, exactly where the bleb is, how big the bleb is, how much of the vector came out. By doing intraoperative OCT, we have a very objective way to kind of uh, measure that and make sure that it's uh, reasonably uh, the same. So, so I think that, you know, and we're going to have I, eventually, like, like Tom was saying, we'll have centers of excellence for, for subretinal delivery. Again, the numbers of these patients is not going to be enormous, so I think we'll have that well under to control. You know, I think the, the, the challenge with, again, uh, intravitreal injections is, again, the proximity of the vector to the target. Um, and I think, you know, when, you're, when we think of our standard intravitreal injection, we don't really worry about that. We put it someplace in the vitreous, and it works. Um, but it's not so clear that that will always be the case with gene therapy and, and this proximity issue and, and the clearance of the vector and how much transduction you get are still technical issues that I think we still have to think about. And what is the, the interference of the vitreous with the transduction efficiency and going through the you know, uh, ILM and all these other kinds of issues are things that are still under, under underway. But, but ultimately, I think for photoreceptor transduction at this point, um, I think uh, subretinal is, is, is a very attractive way, and, and, and I think it's becoming less and less of an issue. Tom, you want to add to that, then maybe a word on why Spark has chosen to go centers of excellence and how that might sort of optimize the, the well, it's reproducibility? A, it's a multifaceted answer. Um, I think the, the, the short answer is that you know, it's part of our risk management um, plan with the FDA. Uh, the mean age of the patients in the phase three trial was 15. Uh, and so many of these patients will be um, children. Uh, we know that doing vitrectomy on children can be more difficult because they can have sticky hyaloid and it can be difficult to detach the hyaloid. Um, so, so, you know, in this patient subpopulation, it's a rare population, um, the surgery can be uh, more difficult than a typical uh, retina practice where, you, where the average age might be in the 60s and the hyaloid is already detached. Um, but, but in short, it was part of the uh, uh, risk management plan with the FDA. David, will we be able to target these vectors from an intravenous delivery to go mm -hmm. to the RPE, for example, or is that too specific, not possible? I think it's certainly something we could do with the uh, directed vector evolution platform. Again, none of these vectors that are present in nature were evolved for therapeutic intent for any particular tissue. So you need a, a technology that can use the power of evolution to identify vectors that can achieve that phenotype, uh, whether it's by intravitreal or IV infusion. I think for us, the, the huge advantages of intravitreal dosing is, is not only its simplicity and safety and its, its routine and can be done at a huge number of sites, but I think as importantly, it gives you the ability to treat the entire retina and not only cover 10% or less, which is typically what's reported with subretinal injection. I think for diseases where you want to intervene early and it's affecting the entire retina or the periphery of the retina, I think you're going to need something that can broadly target the retina, uh, such as with intravitreal. Great. Okay. What's the importance of pre-existing immunity? Uh, maybe just speak to one of you can pick. Um, who can get these treatments? Can you get it if you have antibodies against adenoviruses, for example? And uh, how often do, does the durability wane due to secondary neutralization? Somebody want to pick that up? 
I'm happy to. Yeah. Um, so, so I think pre-existing AAV immunity is, is, is the importance of that is dependent on uh, the serotype you're using, the vector. We, we certainly can evolve our vectors to become resistance, resistant to pre-existing immunity, and there's certain serotypes where the prevalence of immunity is much less. I think it also is dependent on the route of administration. My understanding of subretinal injection is probably not as important because you really get such high local concentrations, you could probably swamp out any uh, problem with antibodies, so I think there is maybe less important. But it's for, certainly for intravenous delivery where you want to target uh, skeletal muscle or some large uh, organ in the body, I think it is an important issue. And uh, certainly for our approach to that is to evolve vectors that are highly resistant to pre-existing antibodies. I just want to confirm what, what David mentioned. Uh, uh, you know, in the Luxterna phase three trial, it's subretinal delivery. Um, there was minimal change in um, antibody um, titers in these patients. There was no uh, deleterious immune responses. However, um, you know, in hematology, uh, uh, for hemophilia, uh, pre-existing, you know, AAV immunity uh, can be a potential problem. Did you exclude uh, patients who had pre-existing immunity? Um, in the I external figured. trial, no. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. <clears throat> what do we... Well, this is... Um, the inflammation question. Luxterna's endpoint was novel. We've touched on this earlier today, um, and you maybe, again, uh, since each video is a little bit independent, at a very, in a very brief and high level, um, Tom, explain what was novel about it and um, how you think that extends to other eye conditions where Snell and vision is really less relevant. We're talking about no vision or ambulatory vision and, and how that's going to impact trials moving forward. And related to that, surrogates that people might use in earlier trials or start exploring. So how do you think about that? Sure. So um, biallelic RP65 mutation-associated retinal dystrophy um, you know, is a cone-mediated disease. Uh, visual acuity is not really expected to, to change much until very late in the disease. So with these, with these um, broad-mediated diseases, we're going to be affecting light sensitivity and, and visual fields. Um, and what's important for the patient, and I think we heard this in some of the earlier talks, is, is functional vision. What can and can't they do? What's their reading speed? Can they drive? And now in this case, um, can they, how can they function in the real world? And so a, a test of functional vision is the ability to navigate, and in this case, under different lighting conditions. So in conjunction with the FDA, uh, this novel endpoint was designed, and, and to back up a bit, um, mobility tests have been around for a while. Um, and what was unique about this mobility test is that it was done under multiple luminances. Um, so it's a real-world test. Um, these seven different light levels were grounded in real-world lighting conditions. Um, so, for example, 400 lux represents typical um, uh, lighting in the office, whereas one lux uh, is the lighting in a moonless summer night. Um, patients will ambulate through uh, one of 12 different mazes, if you will, and they receive time penalties if they go off course and so forth. Um, and we can assess their ability to uh, ambulate under different lighting conditions uh, and measure that and then uh, assess for improvement. So in the study, they improved by two light levels, which was the median improvement, um, and that's a real-world test of, of functional vision. Um, and then in terms of how that was set up, uh, you know, we had to do a validation study. So actually in the validation study, uh, that involved uh, 26 normally sighted patients and 28 patients with uh, various forms of IRDs. And they were actually tested sequentially over a one year time point to look for stability and to also look for correlations. And it turned out that um, the patients who are normally sighted uh, had no change over one year. And the patients who had some form of IRD, um, eight of them uh, uh, lost uh, the ability to uh, navigate, which was expected. Um, and then correlations were determined based on um, uh, Goldman visual fields, visual acuity, and light sensitivity. And there were some uh, stronger correlations with light sensitivity. So um, uh, this endpoint was designed uh, uh, in conjunction with the FDA. And as I mentioned earlier, the FDA just put out guidance on um, uh, gene therapy for retinal disorders, and in, in that guidance document, they actually made a reference to this uh, endpoint, and um, they actually recommended that companies look into designing um, uh, functional endpoints such as this. Barrett? I think that this, this, what this SPARC has done is not just served us well in gene therapy, but I think it served us well in talking to the FDA. Um, it's forced them to re-examine the gold standard that they had been comfortable with 
for many, many years of 15 ETDRS letters. And it's not just that they were open to functional vision, they now recognize and accept that they encourage companies to develop their own functional vision tests. And I think that will serve us all well in ophthalmology moving forward. And just to echo another point, I was at a uh, meeting a few weeks ago, it was a clinical retina meeting, and I made all these points, but the point I made to these retinal clinicians is that we already have problems with visual acuity in the clinic. So for example, macular pucker, for those of you who are retina surgeons, we have patients all the time who are absolutely miserable with macular pucker, but their visual acuity is 20, 30. And that's because they have horrible metamorphopsia and they have terrible reading speed. Both of those we don't measure. So visual acuity um, you know, doesn't reflect their symptomatology. Uh, another condition is vitreous floaters. We have, at least you know, in Indiana, we have these Purdue engineers that get um, cataract surgery in their 50s and they have multifocal lenses. All of a sudden, their floaters drive them miserable. They come in, you measure their vision, they're 20, 20 with horrible floaters. So I think visual acuity is, is, is really sometimes not the best endpoint in many cases. Carl, you want to have, say a cautionary word here at the end? I can see it in your eyes. Well, not so much cautionary. I mean, as someone who's run several of the uh, NEI FDA endpoints meetings and has worked with the FDA on these novel endpoints like for geographic atrophy, you know, I do think that the agency is, is very open. Uh, you know, I think the, the challenge with functional endpoints is that there's lots of variability, and that's where all the, the, the challenge will be. Um, and that's why even the, the agency would, would love us to, to decipher the OCT findings. And I do think this is where potentially uh, the machine learning algorithms can hopefully allow us to be a little more precise on what are some of the changes that a gene therapy trial may need to show early on uh, with OCTs that might then herald a reproducible functional endpoint. But uh, that is just a word of caution. In general, we do lots of novel functional endpoints at our institution, and we've discussed them with the agency. And again, you know, the variability is something that we always have to be aware of. So it's something that in concert with the, ana with the uh, you know, OCT findings, I think is going to be the, uh, one of the important findings that we'll be able to, to uh, generate. Great. Uh, so this was the beginning of a discussion on this topic. I'm sure we will revisit it at future OIS meetings. I'm, I think there are over 500 gene therapy trials actively ongoing around the world, not within ophthalmology, but broadly. So it's an amazingly active area. Thank you all for uh, participating.